recording. Welcome to the Advanced Pressbooks uh, EDU publishing training session. I'm Steele Wagstaff from Pressbooks and Amy Song, my colleague, is here and will be answering questions in the chat. What I want to do to start is to start with showing you some examples for what a kind of uh, fully developed Pressbooks book might look like and give you a couple of representational examples from a few different disciplines. So I'm going to start with the discipline that I used to work in here. Uh, I'm now sharing my screen. Can everyone see the screen that's being shared here? Uh, it's a Pressbooks example that says poetry assignment. Good, okay. So uh, what, what we're seeing is, is an example of a chapter here that's teaching a poetry class. And you'll see that it starts with the chapter name, it's got the author's title here. And then this is an example of a kind of advanced text box where I'm introducing some publication history. And you'll notice as you start to view the publication history, you'll see a few different examples of things. One of them is these highlighted words. And so this is an example of a book that's using the built-in annotation tool hypothesis. So if I were to click on one of these annotations, the pane on the left or the right hand side of the screen will expand and you'll see that public annotation has been built into this book. So the word Niedeker has been annotated in the public layer with a biographical note about this person. Later on, we could see another word, New Goose, and you'll see that the annotation layer here includes images and other kinds of examples. The next thing we might see in the book is this uh, what looks like a link, but with a dash underline. And that means that it's a glossary term. I'll show you how to create glossary terms later, but the way that glossary terms work is that when you click on them, a definition will pop up on the screen. And so you can uh, apply glossary terms or definitions to any words in your book and then have the glossary appear there. And the glossary terms will also be collected if you want them to be in a full book glossary as a special back matter type. Later on, you'll see here's an example of a footnote. So you'll see a raised link number. As you hover over it, you'll see a tool tip that gives you the full footnote content, or you can click on the footnote and it will jump down to the footnote. Here's the actual content of that particular footnote. And then there's a back button that lets you jump back to its location in the text. So those are some of the kind of basic features that we'll cover and show you how to build and make. You'll see that there's lots more different kinds of annotations. You could view all of them in the book and you can see in the annotation layer, you can include things like audio elements. Or closure. You can also include things, so if I scroll down a bit further, you can include uh, historical markers or pictures and you can include embedded videos and other kinds of rich media uh, if you wanted to uh, in the annotation layer. The other thing to note about the annotations, which I'll show you later, is that each annotation has its own URL. So if you made an annotation and wanted to share it with students to point them to a specific part of your text and maybe your explanation of it, you can always just share the URL and that will open the book, open the annotation and kind of steer their attention right to the part of the book that you wanted to anchor or highlight. So we'll cover that in a bit more detail later. The next thing that you'll see here is an example of interactive element built with an open source tool called H5P, which we've also integrated in Pressbooks. So here, as an example, I've had students read this short little introduction to this poem, and then I asked them a question. It's just a knowledge check question. Did Nidaker publish this poem during her lifetime? And as they've answered it, they're going to get some feedback, some individual feedback that's programmed to happen in real time. So you can build these interactive components and put those throughout your book as well to make the book more of a check your knowledge, interactive, formative learning experience. The poem itself has a bunch of annotations. And then there might be a multi-part post-poem assessment. In this case, I can work through and I can see here's the first question. The next question has some fill in the blank parts, so I can start filling these out. And if I can type and talk at the same time, which I'm very bad at, you'll see here's one that has a hint in it. If I click on it, uh, what state has the capital of Madison? I think that's Wisconsin. I ought to know that. And I could check these and see, okay, I got those correct. Here's one where I'm gonna get some of them wrong on purpose. So I'm checking the end words. And I'll say, okay, I got one of four. I could then show the solution and I could see, oh, okay, those are the correct answers. And I could retry it until I was ready to, to move on to the next part of the activity. And then you can see things like true or false questions built in. You can also embed video and other kind of multimedia. I'll show you how to put images, media, audio in your press book. And then there's different kinds of H5P activities that can be inserted in a chapter. So that's an example of like a literature type book that, that will show you how to build all of these components here in the training. The next, I think we had uh, some people coming from a medical school. So here's a similar example from an anatomy course that's kind of a 
smaller version of this where they started with some learning objectives. They describe what the learning objectives are for this chapter, and then they begin presenting information about the epidermis of the dermis. And they've got an image here with a caption. They have a knowledge check that comes right after. They're putting in the structure of the skin uh, graphic, and then a knowledge check that follows after. Appendages of the skin, again, a knowledge check. You can see that they've built like a, a pattern of familiar experiences for the learner to follow as they work through this book. Um, and then at the end, they have a more complicated knowledge check where it's a series of flashcards that ask you about first, second, and third degree burns. So I might say first degree burn here and check my answer. I got that one correct. And it will take me through and I can work through these flashcards. And these are in another example of the type of H5P activities that you can build into your book. The next example would be from a language teaching course. So I know we have some ESL instructors and other people in this training. So here's an example of someone, uh, a textbook, kind of modified version of a beginning Brazilian Portuguese text. So you might start with learning objectives again, and then they put some examples. They built a verb table here that, that you can see. There would be a practice activity where you practice your ser and a star. It's a series of multiple choice or a series of uh, correct select the response questions that moves through and will give you real-time feedback. And then they built a different set of, uh, a different kind of table for the vocabulary. So here we're learning about countries. I can sort them so that I see all of the feminine endings, masculine endings, and plural endings. I can also sort by the alphabetical order of the Portuguese noun, and then I can see the English translation. I could also say, I only wanna work on feminine, uh, well, I can't filter just by A because all these words have the letter A in it, but I could say, let's just look at plurals. And I filtered this table in an interactive way, and I'm seeing just without a few notes here. Um, and so that's another kind of tool that you can build these interactive, filterable, sortable tables. We'll talk about that in the training. And then here's another example of a kind of flashcard activity where you would, I don't think this is right, Morango. Um, we've been picking fresh blackberries lately now that we moved to Oregon. I don't remember what the word is in Portuguese, but they're delicious. Yeah, it's Amora. That's good, love, right? And then this one, I, uh, La Flambuesa. Right, so, you know, there's some questions in the chat that I think um, great. you could prob probably answer. <laughs> Perfect. So I see some questions um, that came into the chat. Um, Kristen, you're asking about the results for the H5P activities. Those right now uh, don't get, we don't store the results except for cases where there is a working LTI connection and the student has launched it from within a course. So that's an add-on that some universities or some networks will purchase and it will allow a grade pass back to happen between the book and the, the student's um, gradebook in the LMS, but generally it, this would be just for formative assessment and we don't store and track the results for just regular public visitors to the site. We don't have any information about them. Um, so that was Amy's answer. Um, H5P doesn't allow the use of LaTeX with these elements. Isaac, I'll show you that in just a second. Um, okay, thanks, Kristen. Yeah, uh, we're still working on Sakai. We've been waiting for some responses for them, but we hope to, to get that working on Sakai. Uh, and then you can see there's other kinds of examples. There's a fill in the blank or a fill in the blank. Um, I'm getting a lot of these wrong, but you can see retry and show the solutions. There's also these hotspot type activities where this is one where you have to find the tallest tree. Here's the tallest tree, and then you have to find something in the sky. I found it in the sky. You can do a lot of these different image, interactive image hotspot type activities with H5P as well. Um, you can include multimedia elements. So here's an example of an audio element. So there's dialogue that's built in. The student could listen to Luis and Pedro talk about things, and then there might be another kind of mark the words activity that follows it built into the book. Um, the last example I'll show a little bit, just of very quick mathematic representation. So we're using MathJax to render a bunch of math expressions. You can see here is just a simple uh, algebraic expression, and you can choose how you, you can choose a zoom factor, and you can choose to render the math in lots of different options. Generally, you'll pick HTML for the website, um, and then there's some accessibility features and language choices and math choices here. But here's an example of an H5P activity that has uh, mathematical expressions. So A squared plus B squared equals, is it 55? Or no, in this case, it's C squared, and that was represented with LaTeX. Um, and H5P was able to grade it and assess it there. So hopefully that was your question, Isaac. Uh, we can get into more advanced detail and show that. 
But what I wanted to show here was just a range of different kinds of textbooks examples. Some of them may resemble what you're working on, and some of them may have given you ideas for what you want to build. So the first thing that I want to do is I want to say, let's suppose you found an existing book that you really like that's openly licensed. Some of you are talking about revisions, remixes, adaptations. I want to start this training by showing you how you can get started with an existing book by just cloning the book. So there's a book that I saw pretty recently by Russell Sharman at the University of Arkansas. This book looked really interesting to me. It's an introduction to cinema. I started just reading it for pleasure because it was quite cool. And I thought, hey, I want to, I noticed this book has a Creative Commons uh, attribution non-commercial share alike license, which means that I'm able to make a revision and a remix as long as I'm not selling it and using it for commercial purposes, which I'm not. So I will take this book. I'll come onto my Pressbooks network where I have an account and we'll come to the admin screen and you should see a create a new book or clone a book option when you log in under my books. So I'm going to click clone a book and I'm going to enter the URL of the book that I want to clone and I'm going to tell this network where I want it to live. I want it to live at moving pictures and then I'm going to click the clone it button. So what's happening here is that Pressbooks is saying, okay, we're going to go try to find an existing book at this address. Is the book public? And it looks and says, yeah, this book is public. And then it says, does it have a Creative Commons license that allows cloning? In this case, the answer is yes. And so then Pressbooks says, great, now give me the book. And it's cloning or making a copy of that existing book. When we make a copy, it will include all of the media that was included with that parent book. It will include the H5P activities and other kind of interactive pieces. And it will just make a perfect, hopefully a perfect local copy that I can then revise, remix, adapt, and redistribute uh, as I see fit. It'll take a few seconds, took about 40 seconds, and you can see now that I have made an identical clone of the Moving Pictures book that was at the University of Arkansas. Here's my local version that lives on my integrations test network. So you can see it looks just about identical. And you'll also see now at the bottom, there will be a book source statement. So the original book required an attribution if you cloned it, and now here's my attribution. This book is a cloned version of and a link to the original by Russell Sharman, published using Pressbooks under a license. It may differ from the original because we might be editing and revising it. So that was the initial step to show you how you could clone and adapt a book. Um, now, once I've cloned the book, I can then come in and I could make edits to any one of the chapters and I could add elements. I could start to revise and do different things. The first thing that I want to show you is very simply how you could add a media element or uh, some new piece of media to this. So I went to the Creative Commons search um, and Heidi, we'll get to that in just a second. Yes. Um, Heidi asked whether you could clone parts of a book rather than the whole thing. So here I went to the Creative Commons search uh, engine and it allows you to search a bunch of openly licensed images. And I was looking for something about the Lumiere brothers who were involved in the history of cinema. And I found this was a very cool a historical plaque that I believe has been placed in France uh, celebrating the, uh, the 50th anniversary of their professional cinema something or other. And it has a CC license. So what I'm going to do is on this image, uh, I'm going to take this image and I'm going to save the image locally to my computer. And then I'm going to come into the book and I'll say at the top of this book. Uh, I think he talks about the Lumiere brothers. Here we go. Here's the Lumiere brothers. So he's got a little video in here and I'm going to add this image right after this video. Here's a plaque commemorating early cinema. And then what I'll click in Pressbooks is I'll click the add media button and then I'll come to upload files and I'll take the file that I've downloaded and bring it into my library. At this point, there's some metadata that you'll want to enter for your, uh, for your image. The first and most important thing is that you always want to add alt text to make sure the image is accessible to others. And so this would be a uh, plaque. Actually, let's just look at the description and see how they described it. It doesn't say much, it just says plaque, but I will write a more descriptive uh, honor Brothers. Um, and then I could add a caption if I wanted. The other thing that I want to do because it's an open image is give an attribution. And in this case, the image itself, the URL is here. 
So I'll drop the source URL. The author was Luke McKernan. So I'll add that. And then the license in this case was CCBYSA. So I'll say CCBYSA. I didn't make any adaptations, I'll just leave it like that. And I'll insert the full size image into my chapter. So I just inserted an image here that has an attribution that came from another source and I could save my chapter and then take a look at it. Oops. So here's the image, the plaque that I just inserted um, from Creative Commons. And that's the very basic part of like cloning a book and, and adding uh, images with attributions. If you'd like to turn the attributions on so that they're always visible to users, you'll see under theme options, appearance theme options, you can click this setting to display your media attributions at the end of the chapter. So if you're using a lot of uh, openly licensed images, it's a good idea to turn this setting on. And now what you'll see is at the end of that particular chapter, there will be a, the attribution for that, that image that I added will now appear here, my media attribution. This image by Luke McKernan is licensed under a CCBY share like license. So I'm fulfilling the license requirement to give attribution by adding that metadata and making sure that it displays there in the chapter. Okay, the next question was how do I do um, if I only want part of a book and not the whole book? So there's a lot of different ways to bring content into Pressbooks. And let's start with this cloned book that I have. Um, suppose, uh, actually, let's just start with a new book. We'll just create a, a sample new book and it'll be my test demo fake. So I've just created a new book. Um, Kate, if you're, if you're putting your own original images in, uh, you do the same attribution as I just showed you there and you would just list yourself as the, uh, the source. Um, so if you were to look, let me go back a stage step here, just so I can show you that. So in the media library, here what I would do is for the attribution value, I could give a source URL if I wanted one, or I would just list myself as the author. If I had taken this photograph, I would say steal Wagstaff, and then I would choose the license that I wanted to share it under or release it under. Um, and that would be uh, the best way to include the right attribution information for your images if it's important to you to have them uh, attributed by others. Yep. Okay, so here I've created an empty book. And Heidi's question is, what if I want to just bring in a part of an existing press book? So in the, the dashboard, you'll see tools and you'll see import. And we support a bunch of different methods to bring content in. This question though, let's say I only wanted three of the chapters from this book and not the whole thing. So what I would do in this case would be, I would import from web page or press books web book, and I would give it this URL. So instead of cloning the whole book, we'll use our API to clone parts of the book. So when I click begin import, it will say, okay, I recognize that book. It's a press book, it has an open license. And then it will show me which pieces of this book do you want? And so in this case, Heidi, I might say, I want the brief history of cinema and I want the chapter on cinematography. And I want the chapter on acting. And I want this part called an introduction to cinema. I guess I should probably use the steal this book and about the author too, but I don't want the rest of it for example, and I would say import only that selection. So what's happening now is a similar process where in Pressbooks we're looking up that source book and we're grabbing those chapters and those chapters only. I could repeat this process for as many different Pressbooks as I wanted to make a huge Franken book made up of pieces from any openly licensed book that exists out there. The Heidi, next... to... Oh, oh, sorry, Steele. Please. And Heidi, just to add, um, I think that, I think this part confuses people because not only is there the import function, but there's also the cloning function and people are confused about how they can use both or either. And it depends on what you want, right? Because cloning, our API will pull every piece of data. So that includes glossary terms, H5P activities, all of the media and its attributions, all of that will carry over. So let's say you, you're really happy with a textbook that someone else has written from another institution that you have found um, on a Pressbooks network, 
but you would like to add one or two of your own chapters. In that case, cloning, a, cloning that book and then adding your own chapters in might be more fruitful than let's say to write your own book and then import you know, 80% of the chapter. So it just depends on the order in which you'd like to do it and um, what, what you want out of it. I yeah. hope that clarifies things a little bit more as well. Okay. Thank you, Amy. Um, the other thing I can show really quickly is that you can also import from other sources. So if I have an EPUB or a Word document or even the XML export from a WordPress or a Pressbook site, we can import from any of those sources. I will show the Word document import just because it's a pretty common operation. So if I have a Word document that's already formatted and ready to use, um, ah, okay, Sarah, so the reason that it imported into the separate part was that when I was doing the import, uh, I also I also told it to import that part that contained those chapters. Um, so there was a part called an introduction to cinema. And because I told it to bring the part in, as well as the chapters, the chapters were remained associated with the part that they came from. Otherwise, you're right, they'll all just end up in a big blob and you have to move them around later. Um, but if I go back to the import section, so I've got the tools import, and you'll see that blob problem here in just a second. When I go to word, I pick a Word document, I have on my computer a already prepared um, Word document here that's called chapter import. I've selected that file and I'm going to upload it. And what Pressbooks will do is it's going to parse this Word document and it says, oh, we think we found the following four chapters based on your headings. And I'll say, yeah, let's, those are the right ones. Let's actually, yeah, let's bring them all in. And I'll say import those. So it's going to import these into the first available part. And so you'll notice now, here are the four new chapters that I just imported from Word. And as an example, this is what one of them might look like. It's got a filler paragraph. I was able to bring in a footnote that was in the Word document created with the short code. And I was able to bring in list items, block quotes, columns, all the kinds of features that you might want in Pressbooks can be imported from Word as long as you're using our short codes. So I will, uh, Amy, if you're willing, would you grab the link to our short codes um, guide in the, or document in the guide and pop, put it in the chat. And then you can see here's another chapter that was brought in from a Word document. It's from Kafka's Metamorphosis. And here's another chapter. So it just brought in and imported a bunch of content. So you can build hybrid text from many different sources. And usually the way to do it if you're not just using the straight up Pressbooks clone is tools import and then finding the appropriate file type and importing it in. So that's a little bit about how to bring content in. The next thing I want to show you is let's go back though to the, what was the moving pictures book. There's another setting that's pretty helpful and it's for a cloned book under theme options. You can also turn on, um, where is it at? Global option, no, it's under web options. Under web options, so you go to appearance, theme options, web options. There's a tool that says enable source comparison. What this does is it only appears for cloned books, but what it does is at the bottom of each chapter, it allows the reader to turn on a comparison tool that shows them how this book might differ from the original. So I click save changes here. And let's go look at that early cinema. You so remember that I put in that Lumiere Brothers image. So if I look at a brief history of cinema and I come to the bottom of my chapter, there'll be this show comparison with original tool. If I click on it now, this is working and it's going to show me, you can see there were five additions and five deletions if I compare the two chapters. So, so far it's the same. And then you'll notice I've added this part in green. In my book, there's a paragraph that says, here's a plaque commemorate, oops, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. I pressed the my keyboard button and navigated through the page. Um, you'll see here, here's a plaque commemorating early cinema and it shows you that I've added a link in an image in my book, whereas that wasn't there in the original book. So that's a tool that can that you may want to turn on if you're making a clone and making significant revisions, just because it gives readers the chance to see what you've revised, what you've changed, and it can be helpful for others who might say, oh, how does this book differ from the parent that I'm already familiar with? Okay, that's a little bit about cloning and importing content. I'm gonna pause there and say, what questions do people have that we haven't already answered or that didn't show up in the chat?
Okay, great. So the next thing I want to show then is I'm going to go back into the back end and the editor, and we're going to talk about how to add tables, how to add text boxes, and how to add other kinds of media. So let me come to my new test book that I just made. Test fake demo. Okay. So here in test fake demo, I've got chapter one and I've got an empty chapter. And the first thing that I may want to do is just to create a simple table of some kind. And so in Pressbooks, you'll see in the visual editor, there's a table creation tool. And this tool will let me make a table and choose the initially the dimensions of this table. So I'm just going to make a four by four table. And then within the table, once I've created it, I will be able to click table properties. And you can see that I can specify width, height, cell spacing, caption, etc. I can also choose a class for the table. And this is going to be most helpful because the standard table just has an outside border but doesn't have internal grid lines. A lot of times people will say, oh, I want a full grid table. And when I say, okay, now I can see where my cells are. So you'll notice that under table properties, there's a number of different types of tables. There's a no lines, lines, shaded. And then you can also turn, if it's a very long table that's short, you can flip it so that it displays landscape. That's helpful if you're presenting like a lot of scientific data in a large tabular format. So you can choose the kind of table style from that table properties option. The other thing that you'll notice is that within a row and within a column, you'll also see that there are cell properties, row properties, so table row properties. I could choose in this row to have a shaded row here and a shaded row here. And that might be just, if it's a very large table, you'll start to see that that table becomes visually a little bit easier to read when you have alternating non-shaded shaded rows. Um, and then you can also look in the table and you could say a column. Uh, you can insert columns, you can delete columns, you can insert rows, delete rows. Um, and that's a little bit about how to use the table builder just to build a very simple table. Um, another thing that you'll want to know about with table properties uh, are whether the table has a caption or not. Um, and once you create caption, you'll see a little caption box where you can enter the caption. Finally, for the table row, often you may want the first row of your table to be a header. So here you would say table row properties. And in this case, you would say uh, row type, header, or footer, depending on the type that the row is. So that helps you make more accessible tables and you can choose some alignment choices and things like that. Um, Melissa asks, they're doing some work in Google Docs. Some elements like tables can transfer between programs in weird ways. Does the import option bring in tables, et cetera, or is it best to leave placeholders? That's a good question. I'm not sure what the, what the current look and feel is for Google Docs tables that come into Pressbooks. So I might just say, you're gonna have to probably convert it into a Word document anyway, and then bring the Word document in. I don't know, you might be best, best off just creating the table afterwards and leaving the placeholder, but I don't know for sure. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know, that's a good question. Um, the other option is though, in, instead of just using the standard table builder, you may want to build an interactive or a more, uh, like the sortable filterable interactive table that you saw in that example book that I was showing in the vocabulary earlier. To do that, there's a plugin that we have available in Pressbooks called Table Press. It should already be active in your books, but if not, you should be able to go to the plugins menu and activate table press if you don't already see it active. It'll be here, usually it's gonna be network active. And when it's network active, you'll see here table press and you'll be able to create a table, import a table or otherwise make interactive tables. So in this case, uh, I could show you how to make a new table. We're gonna make a fake table and it'll be a fake table for demo purposes and we'll make it uh, four rows three columns and it will create a little table interface here that lets me build the table so I'll say name uh, school number of books and we'll start with Amy there's McGill and Amy has 735 four Steel, University of Wisconsin, 2089, and we'll say Jonathan, CSU Pueblo, 1005. So I've made a simple table here. And then below you'll see there's a bunch of complicated, or not complicated, a bunch of uh, additional choices and options. So I could add a link, I could have an image, I could turn on an advanced editor to make uh, math and other kinds of things happen in the cell columns. 
I can combine cells and rows. I can add additional rows. I can show rows. I can delete rows. I can do a bunch of different things. And I can also say the first row of this table is the header, which is in fact true. The last row is the footer. That's not true. Let's show the table this name and the table description above the table. And then um, I'm going to allow sorting and filtering and pagination. We'll do 10 rows per page, which won't matter because this table only has three rows or four rows. And we'll click Save Changes. So I've just created a new table with Table Press, and you'll see that it gives me a short code. I can take the short code and put it anywhere I want in the book. So now when I'm editing my book for chapter one, um, instead I'm going to put this table in here, and then when I preview this, you'll see here's the table that I just built. It's sortable. And I can then filter by looking only for people who have the word university and then Steele and Amy are left. And then I could also search only for values that have zero, zero, and only Jonathan is left. Uh, and that's how you build an interactive table. The next thing you can do with table press, which is kind of cool, is you can also import tables from a bunch of different tabular type sources. So suppose you're building a table and you have a CSV file or an Excel file or an Excel spreadsheet, you can import them. Um, or you can use JSON or something more complicated. In this case, I just have a simple JSON file on my computer that's already ready to go. I'm going to import like a, a larger CSV file and create a table from it. I'm going to add this as a new table, and I'm going to, or you could append it or replace existing tables, but let's add a new table. So I've just created a new table, and it's going to be called financial or I don't know, budgeting trends. And the description is. August 2011 to 2019 firm balance statement. I don't know if that's true. And you'll see the CSV came in with dates, assets, debt, net. So if I was teaching accounting or something, I might want to use a table like this. Let's set it up to show 50 tables, 50 rows per page. And we'll show the table name and we'll save these changes. I've got a new table now. If I come back to my chapter again, let's replace the original table with this one and let's preview that and we'll see now you can see now there's a much larger table that's being displayed and it's showing 50 of the first 100 entries if i click next i'll paginate it and i could change and say let's actually just show 10 per page or let's show 100 per page and the the display of that table just has changed dynamically for the user i could also say i only want to see 2019 and you'll see my data for 2019, it's sortable and filterable. And that's how table press works. I'll pause there and say any questions about building tables or adding um, tables or table press to Pressbooks books. I just want to say I'm really excited and it's beautiful. <laughs> oh, great. Good. Thank you. Well, it's nice to get affirmation like that. Okay, Sarah asked again, what, what sources can be used to um, import tables again? So let me take you back to that screen. From Table Press, in Table Press at least, the import option supports CSVs, Excel files, or the new Excel file, um, as well as an HTML file that resembles a web page. It will try to parse it. I'm, I've never tried a HTML import with Table Press, but you might need to make sure that it actually looks like a table for it to parse. And then you could also use JSON, which is a, a JavaScript object notation format. It will try to parse it and break it into table cells. Um, so those are the options. Um, and you can use a, a file upload, or you can even point to a URL if it exists on the public web. Um, and then there's some additional plugin options. If you really want to dive in, you can load some custom CSS. But generally, it makes sense, the most sense to just leave the CSS as it is. Um, and uh, when you're looking at your list of tables, you can see them here. Here's my table. I could show the short code. I could export it. I can edit the table once it's been made. This lets me resize it. And there's, it's a pretty nice little visual, graphical visual interface. And it's a pretty slick tool, I think, for building interactive tables. The other thing to note is that when you produce an export, this table press tool relies on JavaScript in order to filter and sort and paginate. So when you produce an export, what will happen is for the eBooks and the PDFs, which don't support JavaScript, will just turn table press into a flat table and it will just display as a table 
you obviously can't interact with it, but all of the tabular information will still be there and will just be displayed in the default display order. Jonathan, that was your question. Hopefully that you, I, I could show you actually what it looks like, um, or you could just take my word for it. Let me just show you. Um, Cause Jonathan is a trust but verify kind of person. I know this. Okay, so let's come to the export here and let's make a PDF for digital distribution. Steel, you said it would display in the default order. That's a is is that going to be obvious to us as the authors or well default order is just the order that it's entered here in this table so I see. so if you like click on one of the, the fancy table features to sort it in some particular way that will not be visible. no it, yeah it correct um okay thanks it wouldn't be visible in the pdf the pdf will just display it'll say here is the table data the table content i will just print out the table content in the order that it's entered um Okay, sorry, there's a lot. I forgot I imported other stuff. Okay, so here's my budgeting trends. So here's the table as printed in the PDF. You can just see it was displayed in date order. And then at the bottom, here's the description of the table. Clearly, you can no longer filter and sort and, and do the other things you could in the web book, but all of the tabular content appears and it appears in the order that it was input into the table. So in budgeting trends, you'll see it started with August 2011 and it just went month by month. And in my PDF, it started with August 2011 and just goes month by month. So it's displaying the table content as entered in order in the PDF. Um, landscape tables, what do they look like in the web? Good, okay, um, great question. So let me make a landscape table for you and we'll show you. Um, it'll just display, it'll display them uh, the short answer is it'll display them horizontally. It only will apply the landscape transformation in the export, but I can show that to you if you'd like to see it. Um, so if I have like a table properties, I'll make it full grid landscape. And I'm going to insert another row here because I meant to make another row. So, all right. So let's preview it. You'll see this is going to be a landscape table in the PDF, but in the web book, it just is meant to fit in the web content and it will always display horizontally. So sometimes when you have very, very large tables, you, you have a pretty limited palette here and you're gonna see that very wide tables don't look great on a constrained web book. And that's the problem with tables and short web books, I guess. So there's not really a great workaround for that. So um, thanks for those questions, Sarah and Jonathan. I'll take any other questions on tables and if no one else has them, I'll start showing how to do text boxes and media. Okay, next thing I'll show then is text boxes. So there's a bunch of different text boxes that we allow you to create. The very simple one is the standard text box, which is just a text box. It looks like this, you put your content inside of it. Its cousin, its close cousin is the shaded text box, which is a standard text box with a very light gray background on it. And then there are some more uh, colorful uh, multi-part text boxes that are often used for common textbook type uh, boxes. The first of them would be the learning objectives box. And so when you create one, you'll click that button and it will just make a generic box that has, uh, if you look in the back end, it is a div that has a text box class that says text box learning objectives. There's a header and in that header, it says learning objectives. So you could customize this so you could say lesson one learning objectives. And then you'll have some paragraph content down here that you can um, edit and modify. So what this has is this has a specific class. So this is the learning objectives box. And then you could say, let's do key takeaways is another one that you might have at the end of your chapter. You might have exercises and you might have examples. 
And you'll notice that there's four preset ones and every theme, each one of these has a different color scheme. The color scheme is chosen by the theme, but can be modified by the book author globally for the book. So I've created these four and if I were to come into appearance theme options, you'll see here are the global ch options for each of those individual text boxes. So you'll notice that learning objectives right now has this green scheme with the white header color. So here I would say, let's make the learning objectives a dark red and the background will be I don't know, a light red. So it's fine, like a pink and the header color will make this, uh, I'll make it a little gray. just to make some subtle changes. And so now when I go back and reload this page, uh, my chapter, you'll notice that the learning objective have become this pink color globally throughout the book. So that's what you can do with the, uh, the various text boxes. And so you can use this to establish like a visual pattern language for your book and some repeatable elements. Um, Isaac asked about changing the text boxes. Um, you can certainly change the shape or the, the, like you could put rounded edges or other kinds of things in the text boxes with CSS. So as long as you know the CSS, you could apply whatever rules you wanted, targeting just the class of the text box or the class of the particular text box you wanted. But generally they come in these kind of pre-built shapes and colors. The colors are pretty easy to change from theme options as I just showed you there. Um, then uh, when I come into the book, in addition to making text boxes, um, you can also insert media. So you saw that earlier that I inserted an image, um, but what I want to show here is how you could insert other kinds of media. So for example, I have an MP3 file, an audio file that I have downloaded from an example website. I can drag that into the media library and here you'll see it's going to upload. Um, you can upload files up to 25 megabytes in size to Pressbooks networks. If it's larger than that, you should host it elsewhere and, and just link it or stream it because we're not meant to be a media server, but we can serve up smaller images or smaller images and audio elements. Here you'll see there's a title for this uh, song. There's an artist, there's an album. You can give it a caption and a description. And then you can choose what type of, in this case, I want an embedded media player. So I'll click insert into chapter and you'll notice there's now an embedded audio element in this book. You can do the same thing with small video, though we generally don't encourage it but I'll just show you an example of a small video that I have. Um, so I made a very tiny screen recording and you can upload the video here in MP4 file and embed the video. Usually for video, you're gonna have better results uploading it to a streaming service and embedding it. And I'll show that shortly in a second. So here's an embedded video. Um, the next thing that I'll create here would be if I went to a streaming video site like Vimeo, and let's search for education. So here's a video from Zach Miller that says what education is. Let's say I like that video and want to embed it in my book. I simply take the URL, I come back to the chapter, I'm on its own line in the visual editor, I paste it. And because Vimeo supports OEmbed, it will automatically convert this into an embedded video. The same thing is true of YouTube. So if I go to YouTube and here's a video of a demo that we did to show how LTI works. So I would take that URL, I come back to the chapter and I paste it on its own line and it will create an embedded video. So showing you how all those things preview and work. <clears throat> so you'll see an audio element, an embedded video, a video from Vimeo, and a video from YouTube. The other big feat. Oh, it's embarrassing to watch yourself talk, so I shouldn't have picked that example, but well, I'll save that chapter. Now the question is, um, what happens to all this embedded media when you produce exports? Well, so what we try to do is what we always wanna make sure that the experience degrades as gracefully as possible for different formats that don't support embedded media. If you're exporting to EPUB 3, then the audio files will be included with the EPUB package and can be played. They'll, it'll just make the download a bit bigger. But generally what will happen is, let me just make an export and show you. Um, what will happen is we'll put a little placeholder that says, 
there was an interactive or media element of this in this text that has been excluded from this export, you can find it at, and then there's a link to the chapter so they can find it on the web if they want it. Oh, thank you, Melissa. That's a, I learned that from librarians, you know, graceful degradation, preservation. Um, okay, so let's look at the digital PDF here and we'll wait for it to download and then we'll open it up. So here in this chapter, I keep forgetting there's other stuff. Okay, so here's the audio element has been excluded. You can listen to it online here. And then if they were to click this link, it would take them to the chapter with the audio element. And something similar happens for the video. Here's the Vimeo video. We are able to include like a thumbnail when it comes from a streaming video service so you can see what the thumbnail video looked like. And then the other content would just appear as expected. Um, and then here's your horizontal, uh, what's it called, table? Um, you know what I mean, landscape table. So that's how it would look in the export. Um, turn sideways on its head. Jonathan had a question that I didn't see. Oh, great. Okay. So um, yes, there are some automated tools. To, can, so Jonathan's question was, uh, is there a good way to check the color accessibility for, uh, for your text box tables? And there are a couple tools. So there's a um, color blindness simulator. What is it? Um, there's a bunch of them, but there's I can't remember the one that I used to use. Um, it might have been this one. There's a nice little tool that you can do, and you can check a number of kind of common colorblind uh, forms of colorblindness. The most common uh, that's experienced by most people is the, the kind of simple red green colorblindness. It's a pretty high percentage of the population struggles to differentiate certain tones of red and green from one another. So it's really good to try to avoid. Um, color encoding that, that conflicts there. The biggest thing to think about though with accessibility and color has to do with the contrast ratio. So especially when you're choosing a background and a color, you wanna make sure that there's a contrast ratio of at least four to one or higher for uh, whatever color text on top of the background text. We don't have a nag that, that, so for example, if I were to pick purple on purple, this doesn't give you a nag, but that will almost guarantee that would be guaranteed to be inaccessible. So we would like to, maybe in the future, Jonathan, we could put a little nag that just warns people, this is not an accessible color combination. Um, hey, Steele. Yeah. Um, I thought you were just explaining things, but I just realized that your um, screen is frozen and it has been for oh, no. the past about five minutes. My, I, you know what I did? I tried to change one of the settings and I paused my screen share. So let me, <laughs> I, Zoom, I'm really good at it. Thanks for everyone for being so patient with me as you were just watching me show pyramids. Um, but luckily, all the things that Steele had just described in terms of uh, embedded videos on exports are exactly as he described them. Um, okay. It just shows. <laughs> um, yes, the default color themes for text boxes, Sarah, are all set with accessible contrast, yes. That's a good question, and the answer is yes. But if you look here, okay, so I'll pull up the PDF that I was trying to show. Did you see the graceful degradation of the audio, video, Vimeo, and YouTube? And then if we were to scroll down a bit further, here is the uh, horizontal table that was inserted, the landscape view. And then what I was trying to show is when you go into the book, if you were to change your header color and your header background, those would not be a good accessible color combination. There is not a mag right now. And, and so you have to kind of trust yourself or trust your users to make sure that they would choose acceptable color contrast. It'd be a nice feature request, an accessibility request, Amy, for us to add that. We do that currently at a couple other places, but not right now in the theme examples place. So um, just be mindful of that when you're choosing your color combinations. That was uh, inserting media. Did anyone have questions about inserting media or embedding media from other sources? Okay, I'll go to math notation next. And math notation is an area where I am not um, the world's expert, but some of the world's experts are on this call. So I'm gonna just kind of sweat nervously as I talk about this and do my best. So um, let me go into my other book and show you. There's a few different things that you can do with 
no, this is not the book. What was my card? I have it. Um, I have a lot of them. Okay. So when you're producing mathematics and press books, the default thing, the default option will be provided with uh, math jacks. So we're doing a couple of things here when we do math. One of them is, I got too many tabs. One of them is we're going to support several different types of input syntax. I know that many of you that are used to working in LaTeX will uh, have a certain kind of uh, parenthesis, open bracket, close bracket notation. We don't currently support that notation, though we're working to add it soon. Right now, in order for the LaTeX to render in, in with MathJax in the web book and properly in the exports, this is the expected syntax form that we give us. So it's short code, LaTeX, close short code LaTeX, and anything inside of it will be rendered as math. You can also use dollar sign LaTeX, dollar sign, and that will uh, also indicate that what follow what it what is included in between that syntax is math. Um, you can add ASCII math syntax as well. So you can use this short code and this short code, or dollar sign ASCII math dollar sign. And we also support MathML, so you can just put MathML input, and we will render that in the browser using MathJax. Your settings are available here under Settings MathJax, and you'll see this big integral showing you that MathJax is rendering and working. In, a, in the actual book itself, what this might look like would be, here's a chapter where here is uh, algebraic expression, and here's a bunch of mathematical or Greek symbols being represented in the browser using MathJax. Uh, so what's happening in the back end is the user has input simply LaTeX short code, the expression, close the LaTeX short code. So you can usually do most of the, represent most of your math needs using that kind of expected syntax. What we'll do is we'll render in the web book using the MathJax library, and then we will produce accessible images or SVGs or PNGs with alt text for the exports that don't support JavaScript. And that's as part of our graceful degradation routine. Um, if you'd like, there is a separate plugin that's mainly for advanced LaTeX users that want to use uh, other packages that may not, be rep may not be supported by MathJax. And that plugin is called WP Quick LaTeX. These are mutually exclusive. So by default, there's a really nice MathJax solution that we've built in or you can turn it off by activating this plugin. What this plugin does is it gives you a different set of settings under Quick LaTeX, and it will allow you to still use the similar kinds of input expressions, as well as declaring LaTeX page and then um, adding support for some of the other delimiters that you might be more used to using. You can see that there are some advanced settings where you can do things like what uh, the Tixie picture package lets you do. So this is pretty advanced graphing modeling that regular LaTeX doesn't support, but with declaring some of these advanced packages, you can do it. Um, and you'll notice that there are some basic settings where you can see font size, font color, how the images are displayed. And then there's some advanced settings. This would be where you declare your packages as well as some of your syntax rules. So again, um, a lot of this is described in a guide chapter we have for the various mathematical options, but just wanted people to know that there's a couple of different routes for rendering mathematics. If you use the quick LaTeX solution, the major difference will be in the web book, you will be rendering images with alt text. It will not be doing the accessible MathJax math rendering. It will be images all the way down, which is fine, but uh, it has some trade-offs. You'll also notice that if you have a very large chapter with tons of equations, the first time you publish the chapter and view it, it's going to take a long time. So it's going to have to go and produce all of those images and put them in place, and then it will cache them and page loads will be faster subsequently. But you might notice kind of slower page loads on the initial build. Um, and those are, that's the kind of 101 level of advanced mathematics. I know there are some advanced math users and I'm happy to take difficult questions and shrug and do my best if you have them. Automated equation numbering, yeah. Um, so I think that Quick LaTeX supports equation number uh, numbering equations using the, if you notice here, um, but I don't know, I believe that that was added manually with the, um, 
I don't know how equations are numbered, to be honest with, in LaTeX. So Jonathan, then the answer is, let me get back to you. I don't know the answer. I'm just guessing right now. Is it supported in MathJax? Okay, me neither. <laughs> so yeah, I don't know. Good question. You always stump me. <laughs> the equation environment gives a number automatically. Thank you, Isaac. So Isaac's our resident expert. Isaac, um, I don't know the, the I don't know an accurate answer, so I'm going to stop speculating. But I will get back to people. All right, now we're going to get into the really fun teaching and learning stuff. And I'm going to start with hypothesis and save H5P for last because it's the most complicated. So the next thing is in this demo book that you saw earlier, let me just remind, refresh everybody for when I'm talking about these tools. The, here's an example of a book where hypothesis is turned on by default. So anyone reading this book will see these annotations and can click on them and could see the annotation layer pop up in Pressbooks. Or if they wanted to, they could produce a new annotation. So when they highlight the word, they will see this annotate highlight button. If I click annotate, this pane will pop up and it will say, you need to log in to make an annotation. But this tool here in the browser pane is called Hypothesis. It's a free and open source annotation tool. They've, they've been real leaders in web annotation standard and we've integrated it so that it works seamlessly or natively with Pressbooks if you want it to. I'm gonna show you the logging in and creating an account part later, but first I wanna show you how you can turn or activate Hypothesis for your individual book if you want it to be natively enabled. It's pretty simple. What you would need to do is, um, let's come to a book that I haven't done this with before. So I'll come to my new uh, test fake demo book. And under settings, you'll see a setting for hypothesis. Here you'll see a bunch of different settings, but the main one that we're thinking about here is the content settings. And this controls where hypothesis is loaded. So I'm gonna say, let's turn it on so that it appears on parts, chapters, front matter, and back matter. And those are the settings that I want for now. I'm going to click Save Changes. Now you'll notice when I load this book, when I load the front matter for this book, you'll now see that the Hypothesis client is just natively appearing and loading for users without them having to take any further action. I've just baked Hypothesis in. So that if I wanted to annotate, the tool will just appear for me. I didn't have to install a browser extension. I didn't have to take any other action. It's just now a native part of my book. In order to make annotations, though, I would need to sign up with Hypothesis. You'd create a free Hypothesis account to make an annotation. You provide a username, email address, and password, and then you can sign up. In my case, I already have an account, so let me just log in with my account information. And you'll see, okay, here's all my annotations. So now when I'm refreshing this page, you'll see I could then select this text. I could annotate it. Um, let me log in. I'm logged in as me, and I can make a public annotation. So commonly called OER. It's not the most helpful annotation. I could add a tag to this annotation, like I might say English 117. And you'll then see I've made an annotation here, and I could then edit it. And here's my tag. Uh, this annotation is public. It's visible to everyone. Someone could reply to it. I could edit it myself. I could share a link to it. I could also decide, hey, I didn't want this to be public. I only want this to be visible to me. I want this to be a private note. And I can change it. And now it's locked. It's private just to me. Another thing that you could do is create a private group for this book as well. So suppose you don't want the annotations to be visible to the whole world. You just want your class to be doing some in-class learning with one another. So I could say, let's make a new private group and we'll call this English 117, fall 2020, because <laughs> you might have many English 117 classes, and I'll create this group. So I've just made this new group. I can invite anyone in my class to join it by giving them this URL. And then I'll come back to my book. Let me refresh the page. And so I have a public annotation, right? That lives at Open Educational Resources. But I might make a separate annotation that says, um, and I want to put this on my English 117 layer. So I switch over to English 117 and I'd say, hey everyone, we're going 
to be learning a lot about OER this semester. Please start by sharing your working definition for this term. Reply to this thread to keep the annotation organized. And I would say, let's post this to my private group. Now what I've done is I've made an annotation on this book that's only visible in a private group. And these annotation layers can all be present on the same book at the same time. So you'll notice I could switch as this user, I have access to many private groups, but I could go back to the public layer and say, oh, here's the annotation that's public. And at the same time, I could switch to my private group and see only those annotations which are present in the private group. For me, what's really helpful in thinking about this from a teaching purpose is I could have the same text, the same public text that's being used in many different courses at the same time, all with their own discussion threads, their own paratext happening in the margins, as well as using it the next semester with a new group of students and just starting fresh and starting anew with a whole new set of group annotations. Um, in order to see the private annotations, users must be logged in and must be a member of that private group, yes. So if you wanted to do private group annotations, both to view and to make, they'll need to be logged in. You do not need to be logged in or have an account to see public annotations, but you do need to have a hypothesis account to make annotations of any kind. Th that account hypothesis process is separate from anything to do with Pressbooks, but um, so you may want to look into whether you think it's a suitable thing to ask your students to do. In my experience, I really like Hypothesis Company. I think they have good values, good practices. Hypothesis is free and open source and accounts will, will be free forever with uh, no expectation that users will be charged or expected to do something that they don't want to do to have uh, continued access to the annotation tool. Um, and thank you, Amy, for clarifying that question. Um, yes, so, so generally like what would happen is if I'm logged out, you won't see any other groups, you'll only see the public group. And so I would only be able to see uh, annotations made on the public layer if I'm logged out. Once I log in, then I'll be able to see annotations made by myself. This was one that I made private to only myself. So let me change that again and make it public again. Um, and I will also be able to see annotations made on any of the private groups to which this logged in user belongs. So if I went back to English 117, you'd see I have a different annotation there. Let's log out again and we'll notice as the, at a logged out user, I will see only those public annotations. There's one annotation and it's public. It was made by Steel Wagstaff four minutes ago. And I can see it here on the book. Um, if you're working in private groups, you have the ability to moderate that group. There's a little flag that you can report uh, an annotation as needing moderation. For the public layer, you can't moderate the public layer, but Hypothesis is very good about moderating based on their terms of service. So that's just what you should know about annotations and how to use them. Questions about Hypothesis or about annotation? Okay, now the last thing that I'll talk about and show is how to use H5P activities. And this is where the taking the, the old idea of a print textbook and turning it into something that's more like modern courseware or interactive learning material. Hypoth or H5P is really the, the tool that we've chosen that makes that happen in Pressbooks. So again, um, it should be uh, available for you in, in, on a Pressbooks EDU network, but to turn it on for your book, You'll come to the plugins menu here, and then you would click activate H5P. Um, in this case, I'd already activated it. So you click activate H5P, and once it's activated, you'll then see just below table press, you'll see a menu that says H5P content. In this book so far, I don't have any H5P content. So the first thing that I would need to do is click add new. It will say, okay, the first time you use it, do you wanna use our hub? And we say yes, and here you'll see the interface that lets you build, install, build, and make H5P activities. There are many different ways to make H5P in the world, but what we're doing here is Pressbooks itself is hosting and letting you build H5P activities that live on your Pressbooks server with your Pressbooks book. So all of these activities will be hosted with your book 
and will be able to be inserted and kind of included pretty tightly with your Pressbooks content. There's two ways to make H5P activities. There's either create from scratch or upload an existing file. So in this case, I've downloaded an existing H5P activity. It was an interactive video. So I'm going to upload that file and we'll say, let's start with this activity that I found in the wild. So let's upload it and it will in, in bring in all the necessary libraries. And then it will say, okay, here's a recreation of the source activity here for this interactive video. And you can then edit and revise and adapt this activity before publishing it to your book. It's taking a second because I'm screen sharing. Okay, so it created the interactive video and you'll see for each H5P activity, there'll be a builder down below. All the activity content types are slightly different, but generally there's two important features that can help you get started. First, you can always click on example and it will show you an example of this content type in the wild built by the H5P folks. So here's an example of interactive video. Okay, there's a pop-up that shows me an interactive element and you'll see on the video, there's several markers that show you where interactivity happens. There's a multiple choice quiz. I could take it. You know, that's not a blueberry. I got that one wrong. Let's retake it. Strawberry, let's continue. And so you can, you can see how an activity was built. And then you also can see a tutorial for most of these. And the tutorial is helpful because it will kind of be like a how-to. So rather than, oh dear, I'm trying to move my Zoom screen without pausing my screen share and I'm not having great success. Okay, here's the tutorial page. And the tutorial will kind of walk you through the steps needed, why you use it, when you use it, and then how to make one. And it will give you like a step-by-step -step guide to making, uploading, and using the tools to build an actual activity. You can see here, there's one that's already built. Um, and you'll see that the, all these steps are in place and you can modify it. When you're ready to publish it, you'd click create. And you'll see that you now have one H5P activity that's been made in your book and you can view it and interact with it here. And you can also view it from your list for all H5P content. If you'd like, I can show you the process of building one from scratch. Um, does anybody have a particular H5P content type that they'd like to see that they think is interesting? Um, there's a list of 40 or so of them here. The chart, okay. Um, let's click Git and we'll click install. All right, so we're gonna click use this first time we make it. And in this case, we'll say, let's look at an example. Here's an example of a pie chart that they generated. Uh, it's pretty nice. So we could start by saying, let's download this source file and reverse engineer it. Or we could just build it from scratch. So let's build from scratch. When you build from scratch, you'll notice you can also produce metadata for uh, an activity, which would say, I'm the author of this. This is gonna be fake demo chart, the license here, I like CCBY, and the author's name is Steel Wagstaff, and I'll save that. And let's leave that, and so now I've just given some attribution statement for this activity so that when others clone it or use it, they can, they can have it correctly. In this case, I wanna make a bar chart. The first element is gonna be number of public books, and the value is gonna be 17. The color will be black, the font color will be white. We'll say number uh, private books, and we'll say 12. The color for this will be pink. We'll add another one, and it will be number of clone books, and we'll say six. And the color for that, let's make it green. Oops. And we'll add one more, which is number of original books, and we'll make this one 19 and we'll make the color a nice vibrant pink. Okay, so I've here's my bar chart type that I'm gonna make and I'm gonna create that chart. So here's my bar chart. Okay, that's what the bar chart looks like. Or let's say, I don't want it to be a bar chart, I actually want it to be a pie chart and let's update it. Here's my pie chart and it doesn't look super great because my my, my uh, text is too long and it's overflowing. So I, you can see there's some limitations there, but that's how the H5P activity in that particular case works. Um, now that I have an H5P activity, though, let's turn it back into, that's just was hard on the eyes. Let's turn it back into a 
parchment. You'll notice that the H5P activity is published and it has a short code. I can also come into the book and in chapter one, just as I inserted media, I can also insert H5P activities as I see fit. So let's come to my exercises chapter section here and let's go ahead and add an H5P and let's add my interactive video there and you'll see the short code was inserted. And here at the bottom, we'll add my fake demo chart and let's save this chapter and we'll take a look at it. Oops. So here we've got all this other interactive stuff we put in earlier. And in my exercises, here's my interactive video. And down below, here's my pie chart. And if I wanted to, you could see, here's the attribution statement that I included as the author. And then someone could also download the source file or copy the content and reuse it and remix it uh, if they wanted to. Users can restrict the ability to do this if they really would like to, so they don't have to openly license it, but we set up everything so that open is by default. If they want to, when you're editing the activity here, you're gonna see on the right-hand side some display options. You can turn off the embed button and the copyright button, and you can disallow users from downloading the content if you wanna restrict reuse and re-share. Re re and those are the choices there. Um, you can add tags to help you keep your H5P activities organized. But you'll also notice that here, you'll have a big list with titles that are only visible to you, content types, authors, tags, and when it was last modified. Um, and that's a little bit about H5P. Uh, H5P, in my opinion, is just one of those really outstanding, uh, almost everything is possible with kind of interactivity tools. As you start looking through this, you'll see there's a bunch of very interesting types of interactive content. Some of the more complex ones, um, there are quiz question sets that was the one you saw in the Niedeker poetry activity where there was multiple different types of questions that just appeared in order. You can also make several image related ones, which we could show in greater detail. Um, and then the branching scenario is very, very powerful. Branching scenario allows you to do something that's like a captivate or a storyline branching scenario activity. It's a little bit complex. You probably need to kind of spend some time learning how to build these activities. But instructional designers can really go to town with a free tool that does a big percentage of what very expensive proprietary tools can do. Um, another similar one that's just been released is called Interactive Book. That's a pretty neat one. Um, it's, it'd be kind of wheels within wheels to do an interactive book within inside of an interactive book, but go nuts if you want to. Um, and then the other uh, interactive type that I think people are pretty interested in is the, uh, where's it at? Course presentation. The course presentation type, let me just show it to you. It allows you to build something like an interactive set of slides. So it's like doing a PowerPoint or an embedded slideshow, except that it can have quizzes and other kinds of interactive things inside of the slide content. So that's a pretty powerful one, especially for kind of lecture-based courses or courses where you might have some content that you wanna present something in something like a presentation or slide-based format. Um, and it's a pretty neat like uh, content type that allows all sorts of interactivity within it. Um, so, so those are some of the more powerful ones to, to use for H5P. Zach asked, if you're creating your own interactive video in Pressbooks, where does the video live? Great. So there's a few different places where the video should live. Um, for interactive video, there's a couple of options. You can, of course, upload the video, though that's not recommended. For interactive video, um, where is it there? Let me type video so I find it. Okay, interactive video. If I were to make a new one, you'll see it allows you to upload or embed the video. You can add a YouTube or Vimeo link here and then I just add the interaction on top of it. So generally that would be what I would recommend. If you wanna do interactive video, make sure the video is on a streaming service and then drop the link in there. I think that there, depending on what kind of streaming, if your campus may have its own streaming video service, and we might need to work with you to make sure that it works to support that. But the public ones like Vimeo and YouTube, you can just drop the URL in. So as an example, let me just grab um, this is just for demo purposes, but we do these pod okay, here's a product number. I'm gonna drop this video in and I'll click insert. And then if I create this, oops. I haven't made any interactions, but you'll see this YouTube link that I just grabbed 
we will now be wrapped in this H5P interactive content player. And so it's pretty simple and pretty easy to do with videos hosted externally. So that's be what I'd recommend, Zach. Okay, I know I've talked for a long time. It's flown by for me. Hopefully it's felt like it's been useful and not just drinking from a fire hose for you. The last thing that I wanna mention is um, if you're getting started with Pressbooks or if you're even an advanced user, most of you should also be able to have local campus resources that you can use to get help and support when you get stuck. On most of your campuses, those people will be called network managers. And the network manager, the role of the network manager is to be basically the front line of support or contact person for Pressbooks on a given campus. Network managers also have the ability to escalate support questions to Amy and I when they can't answer and then they get stuck. So if you have a Pressbooks EDU instance or network that's hosted with Pressbooks, that's part of what's included. It's premium support for your network managers. Um, our recommendation would be get to know your network managers, find out who they are, and send your questions and queries and support requests to them. And then they will also know how to escalate them to us as needed. If you have a question about who your network manager is or how to find out who that is, you can let us know. Um, and Amy and I are in the chat and ready to help you identify who locally can help you with your problems or your questions. But that's what I wanted to cover today. Um, I have a few minutes that I can stick around. I'm gonna stop the recording and we can just talk about anything that you have. Otherwise, I know you're busy people and you've got lots to do. So thanks for your time and attention. And we'll pause or stop the recording now if you're willing, Amy.